Welcome to Rising Stronger Radio, where we explore mental health from a more holistic perspective to empower you to break free from symptoms like anxiety, depression, fatigue, lack of motivation, and addictive behaviors, and instead create an environment both inside and out that is more conducive to healing, vitality, and living a purposeful life. We focus on topics like the power of nutrition, movement, and other lifestyle habits, how to navigate the toxicity and pitfalls of the modern world, as well as philosophical, spiritual, and religious concepts to help you bring out the best in yourself and find your place and purpose in creation. My name is Keith. I'm a holistic health coach and independent mental health researcher. I'm also someone who has faced significant struggles with anxiety, depression, addiction, and other chronic health issues. If you haven't already, you can head over to my website, risingstronger.com, and download my free High Mileage Foods for Mental Health Guide. I also offer a free 30-minute breakthrough chat if you're interested in personalized guidance and dialing in your nutrition and lifestyle habits to support energy, clarity, and happiness. With that said, let's get into today's episode. All right, so welcome back to Rising Stronger Radio. I'm your host, Keith, and today we have with us Tim Anderson, who is the owner and co-founder of Original Strength. I'm getting that right? Yes, sir. Uh, Tim, can we start out with you just giving us uh, a little bit of your history about kind of who you are, what your journey's been like, how you wound up, you know, developing and getting into original strength? Sure. Um, and thank you, Keith, for having me on your show. Um, so <laughs> my journey is kind of weird. Um, I about, I don't know, about 15 years ago, I was, I was an overzealous trainer, um, training my own self anyway. Uh, and I, I, I had to show up every day. Um, and like, I was trying to win some imaginary trophy that just did not exist, um, by lifting weights every day and going to the gym. And as a result of that, I started to get in some nagging overuse injuries, um, because I just wasn't allowing my body to recover. But instead of being smart, I decided to really dive into corrective exercises uh, to learn how to, you know, do corrective exercises so that I could then apply that on top of my training. Um, but I wasn't going to stop training. So, so that's where I went wrong to start with. But anyway, uh, after I learned about corrective exercise and I started mixing them to my training, really what I did is I succeeded in creating excessively long training sessions, um, but still not allowing myself to recover. So I really didn't fix anything. Uh, instead, I just had more nagging issues. Um, one night I got really frustrated uh, because I'm a I, I'm a big kid. I, I love Superman and superheroes. And I was sitting around thinking, well, I just do not feel like Superman. Um, so I asked God to show me how to train to be bulletproof because I wanted to I wanted to feel good, I wanted to be like Superman. And within two weeks, I picked up a book on learning disorders uh, called Smart Moves. And I just started flipping pages and just things started jumping out at me. Um, it was like, it was as if God was just connecting all the dots. And I knew that I knew that I knew that crawling was the thing I needed to do and wanted to do before I ever even did it. Like I was convinced that that's what I was looking for. Uh, and that's really what led to uh, original strength. Um, in that, you know, learning how to crawl and roll around on the floor, I learned how amazingly designed uh, our bodies are. Um, and that's pretty much the story in a, in a nutshell. Awesome. So I'll have many follow-ups on original strength, but to start out, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, the theme of my business and show is mental health is not just mental. Like I, you know, I work as a health coach within the mental health industry. Um, but you know, that, that has come about through my own experiences with mental health challenges and addiction and whatnot, but ver very much through a different lens than the kind of mainstream understanding of mental health, like trying to get people to see that mental health is not just mental and that, you know, we're leaving a lot on the table with the way we approach it most of the time. But there's a quote in your, in the book, um, the reloaded bro book, pressing reset, original strength reloaded, where you say movement is the key to every facet of our health. It shapes everything about us, our brains, our bodies, who we are as people our emotions, our hormones, even our mental health. That was something that I loved from this book. I'll show it so our listeners can see. Um, if you were to kind of take that and then respond in, you know, through your lens to the statement, mental health is not just mental, how would you affirm that idea? 
Oh gosh. Um, so everything about us is whole. We're like whole beings and you can't separate one facet or one quality out from another quality and put it in a vacuum. Um, meaning like on a simple example for physically, you can't really separate stability from mobility. They play together. They dance together. And without one, you just don't have the other. Um, and the same thing is you can't separate your physical, your physicality um, from your emotional health. Because if you don't move well, you don't feel good. And you can't separate your emotions from your, your, your mental health or your thought patterns. Because if your emotions are in the tank, your thoughts are going to be in the tank. And so everything dances together and affects everything, right? So when you have poor thoughts, you have poor movement, you have poor emotions. When you have poor emotions, you have poor movement, you have poor thoughts. When you have poor movement, you have poor thoughts, you have poor emotions. Like everything dances together. Mm -hmm. So you can't, can't separate one thing out from another. So your physical health and well-being enormously affects your mental health and your well-being. Because when you don't feel good, when you hurt, you get trapped into a vacuum of thought. Uh, negative thought and your thoughts start ruling you or using you versus you using your thoughts as a tool they start using you and you just it just it gets to be kind of a, a mess <laughs> um but but everything affects everything is the gist of it um and i can tell you for sure what i've learned is the human body is made to move and movement builds the nervous system it knits the body together and if how we move, though, is tied to our emotions and how we think, if we're made to move and when we move well, we feel really good. Well, then if we're made to move, we have to be made to feel good, period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, teasing out some of that, like how the nervous system and, you know, kind of what you're explaining will come forth in some of the questions that I have. I think, you know, what what it makes me think of with what you just explained is that I think too often, you know, we just really don't know, but we try to solve the problems in our mind or the challenges in our mind, in our mind. And I think we'd have a, an entirely different landscape in terms of mental health. If people thought struggling my mind, let me go to my body and work it out that way, because I'm sure you can agree. But for me personally, like, Anytime I'm caught up in my head or feeling a certain way, if I move, if I go to my body, even if it's jumping jacks or, you know, nowadays it's, it's crawling or uh, mostly original strength resets just mixed in, but that tends to pull you back into the driver's seat instead of having, you know, the emotions being in, you know, in control. Um, would, would you agree that that is, uh, you know, your experience as well? Absolutely. Like, so movement's the lowest hanging fruit. It's very hard to change the mind with the mind. Um, mm -hmm. It's like a, that's a struggle, but it's pretty easy to change your mind or change your thoughts with your, with your body. Um, move, movement's the easiest thing that, and it's almost like a back door. Um, you're not yeah. using force. You're not coming head on at it. You are, you're just coming in through the back door um, and letting all the negativity run out. Yeah. So would you, there's one other thing. Well, let's go. I think it'll it'll segue into this. If you were to take for a layman that that's not familiar with original strength, that's not familiar with, you know, maybe even just vaguely familiar with movement outside of like going to the gym and mm -hmm. what that would entail. How would you explain the original strength system? So um, I would say that original strength is literally that it, it is what the name is it's your original strength and what that means is that humans we are we are made to move um like i just said earlier but we're born with a movement template or a movement program um like called your developmental sequence and as we grow we develop and move through that sequence that is those are the movements that build up our brain and tie tie both hemispheres together uh, make our nervous system efficient um, they tie our, our body together, make our core extremely strong and resilient. And that's why babies are so durable. Um, but so, so you're born with this movement program that's literally designed to make you strong and capable to do whatever it is you want into the world, um, physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, and as an adult, you never lose that program. 
it's always inside of you. And if you ever tap back into it and you start exploring those original movements you were designed to make, which are foundational, by the way, they're just your foundational movements that everything else gets built on top of. If you go back to your foundation, um, it still does all those wonderful things it did for you as a child. It starts building your brain back together. It makes your nervous system more efficient again. It ties your shoulders to your hips again, strengthens your core from the inside out. Um, and it just makes you very resilient physically, but also emotionally and, and mentally. Yeah. The, the, the one thing I was, I couldn't remember about what you had said previously that, that I think can tie in here is you mentioned that we're made to move and moving makes us feel good which means we must be designed to feel good. When you take something like that, I mean, for most people, they'd probably disagree with that because it's like, I do all this stuff and I can really only chase, you know, feeling good through whatever caffeine, sugar, you know, external stimulus. How can you go a little bit deeper just into that aspect that people understand or to help people understand? Because I don't think that most people necessarily would walk around with the idea like I'm designed to move and understanding that and then leading to what you're saying that movement especially when done in the right way I have a similar history of of just burning myself out you know in the gym making myself give myself you know gut issues and nervous system dysregulation and various things from overtraining I don't think people think about movement I guess it's becoming a little bit more popular, just movement used instead of like working out or whatever, but tie that together, together a little bit more where movement and feeling good, uh, you know, if understood properly can really be something that somebody can take away in their daily life and, and, you know, utilize. Uh, I'll try. Um, so if you, if you look at the world, the world current currently is set up for us in, in, in first world countries, um, for sure, um, is more set up for us not to have to move and to use our bodies. So, I mean, if you're just looking at things, how can you say that we're designed to move? But if you just look at the body and its design, then you can clearly see it's designed to move. And so what happens is we've got everything flipped upside down. Um, in our modern world, um, we're sedentary most of the time versus inactive very little. But the way we're designed is, is to be active very much a lot and sedentary very little. <laughs> um, and, and it is that constant movement and stimulating of your, your vestibular system, which is kind of like the easiest description is your balance system up in your head, but that's certainly not all it does at all. Um, but to constantly stimulate your vestibular system or to stimulate your body in different positions against gravity, hmm. that information keeps your body healthy. It makes everything run smoothly. It actually keeps you from aging and breaking down. Uh, so the quality of your life, not only so in today's world, we can live a really long time because of uh, medicine and, 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 and technology and health uh, care, right? Well, health care, I use that word loosely, but, but we, can, we can live a really long time, but it doesn't guarantee we'll have a quality of life. I mean, we can live a really long time in a rest home if we want to um, in a bed. But that's not a quality of life. We're designed to live our entire lifespan with a quality of life. So, and it is movement that keeps the body young enough to enjoy that quality so that you can enjoy that quality and still feel good in your, as you age, like, you know, where you can, if you're 77, you can get on the floor and play with your grandchildren. You can pick them up over your head and play airplane with them. Maybe you just want to go on a walk out in the neighborhood with your spouse those things are, are made to be enjoyed throughout your entire life based off of your design. And your design is, there's no other way around it. The, the human body is designed to move and that keeps the brain very healthy and very functional, which keeps the body very healthy and very functional. Now, in the absence of all of that, in today's world, we've come up with solutions or band-aids um, to, to address the issue of not feeling good. And we might call it exercise or we might call it... Uh, vitamins or pills and there's nothing wrong with vitamins exercise or anything but but that's not our design those are those are temporary solutions that don't actually go to the heart of the matter because if you're going to exercise lift weights for an hour a day well what are you doing the rest of the day are you still you know riding in the car sitting at your desk you know laying on the couch like are you what do you so so you can't erase the majority of sedentary lifestyle with with an hour of exercise every day but you can if you move often throughout the day and it doesn't have to be anything crazy 
yes, you can have a dedicated t movement time to like go through your natural human movements to make sure your foundation is in place. But also, yes, you can get up every 30 minutes and take a walk. <laughs> you can go from everybody like, so now the rage is, is, well, I know sitting's bad, so I'm going to get a standing desk. Eh, standing for long periods of time, not moving is also not great. But moving from standing to sitting from, you know, back and forth, that's a lot, a little bit better now. Um, so it's just, it's just being creative and not getting stuck or trapped to be still. Stillness is, is silence for the brain. And when the brain feels silent or it's got no information coming mm. in, what do you do when you have no information? You don't know what to do. So what's the output and the expression going to look like when it's dependent on the information that comes in, right? So movement generates the information that comes in to tell the brain exactly what to do and how to express itself optimally. But if there's silence, there's stillness. And if there's stillness mm -hmm. or silence, there's just no information. And the brain's now it's, now it's making its best effort to optimally move things where it doesn't have all the complete information. So <clears throat> in terms of sitting, you mentioned how in our, you know, in our modern world, people, most people are not familiar with anything else, you know, just they're on a couch, in a car, in a chair, maybe, you know, going to the gym or getting something in here and there throughout the day or once a day, typically. Um, I've heard you go deeper on this topic with like on your podcast, but if you were to help somebody understand, let's say, A, how relatively new what we do is in terms of human history in being so sedentary and B, the detrimental effects that sitting too much can have and you can go in any direction you know with that that you want can you can you riff on that a little bit i'll try um i'm no historian but you know thousand two that let's we'll just go we'll jump two thousand years ago um man worked with his body all day long he's he's building pyramids he's out in the fields he's building houses or huts he's he's doing something maybe he's looking for food Maybe they're trying to grow food, but he's constantly moving throughout the day, um, generating late. He's, he's doing labor with his body and his hands and his mind. Well, that keeps the body healthy because hmm. um, now he's using everything, right? He's using his body, but he's using his mind, you know, being creative, solving problems, being out there in the world, trying to just to get by, to, to feed his family, whatever. Um, today... Uh, with the you know industrial revolution we've got technology we've got machines we've got transportation um we don't have to walk everywhere we can we can sit down almost with anything we do uh everything's just it's easy it's convenient we don't have to and these things are blessings I mean, don't get me wrong like a grocery store to me is a blessing right because i don't have to go out in the field and and hope that something's growing yeah. You know, no matter how hard I work, I can guarantee it's going to come up. <laughs> if I'm out hunting for an antelope all day, I might not catch one. But if I go to the grocery store, well, hallelujah, there's there's food, there's things that that will sustain me and my family, right? So that's that's all all this stuff is great. But what it does is is it negates it it fools us into thinking that we don't need to move anymore. Because there's no, you know, before there was a need to move. But that need was, you know, it came alongside the design. Well, we still got the same design, but now we just don't have that that drive to move out of necessity anymore, right? So, so now in today's world, we we need to be more deliberate. Um, it's not that our design has changed in any fashion, and it's not that technology and and and, and anything is bad. It's just that we need we still need to honor our design, which says you're made to move, and movement is what keeps you healthy and young um, and capable. Um, so, so that's, that's, and that's really where we're at is that there's just not a lot of necessity anymore for us to use our bodies and our minds like we used to, like when's, think about this. If you need to know something now, there was a time where I needed to know what a Dewey decimal system uh, was. And, and I, I had to physically go to a library and go through a card catalog and find a book. Well, there's a lot of work in, there's mental energy and work involved in that. And there's physical movement involved in that. But now I don't need to know jack squat about a library. I can, all I need to know is how to uh, go to Google. I just need to know Google. And so everything's at my fingertips. So even the little things like that, which are still blessings, 
they further take us out of our design away from moving and using our head. Like if you want to, if you want to know how to spell something, do you try to figure it out or do you just, do you just look it up? Right. I can even ask Siri, how do you spell so-and-so? And she somehow knows the word I'm trying to say. So guess what I found. Exactly. She <laughs> just caught on to that. Always listening. Um, so again, <laughs> we're, we're just further removed from actually using our body as it was intended to be used. Is there anything that you would comment on, like maybe some tangible things one might think about in terms of what excess sitting actually does? I mean, you're touching a lot on the positives and the balance. Uh, you know, I, I think people are becoming more familiar with like sitting is the new smoking kind of thing, but that's not always super motivating for people to actually get up and move when they're busy too, or, or a specific enough, let's say. Yeah. So um, sitting for long periods of time, what ends up happening is your body wants to be very efficient. Um, it strives to be efficient and it doesn't like wasting energy. So when we sit, well, one, we're not using a lot of energy anymore. And most of us will learn to sit to be comfortable. So we don't use our postural muscles to sit. Most of the time we'll slouch or we'll like let the, whatever the shape of the container we're in, we'll actually mold to it like water does. Like, so if it's a a soft back chair, we'll kind of fold back into it because it's comfortable. It's holding us up. It's cradling us, but we're not using our muscles anymore. Right. So then we get efficient at not using our muscles and the body's like, well, what do I need all these muscles for? I'm not, we're not using them. So, and it takes a lot of energy to maintain them. So I'm just going to start getting rid of them. And I may now, now I may, may adapt your fascia to be able to hold you in that comfortable slouch position better. So I don't have to use muscle. So I may actually thicken your fascia fibers or something so I can support you without having to use muscle. Uh, muscle takes a lot of calories to support and then energy and oxygen. And well, we're not using them. So let's, let's change the system. Um, so then you end up losing muscle. Maybe you start getting stiff and stuff because your fascia and your structure does start to change because your body's going to be efficient at holding you the way you're telling it that you want it to hold you. Mm. Because if you show up every day and do the same thing, the body's going to assume that that is exactly what you want to do. So if you want to look like the letter C, your body's going to assume, hey, he he wants to look like the letter C. Let's lay down the groundwork so he can do that and, and where it costs us the least amount of energy possible. Now, the trouble with looking like the letter C and not having our postural muscles is we start to collapse. And when we start to collapse, it changes our breathing patterns. And now, instead of filling our lungs up from the bottom to the top, we may get really good at filling our lungs up at the top and never reaching the bottom. And now the problem with that is, is well, one, we're not getting all the air that we need to. And two, now we're tripping our, our autonomic nervous system into the fight or flight mode because it's, it's used to when the emergency muscles are breathing, well, there must be an emergency. And if I'm only going to breathe out through my chest, I'm only going to use my emergency breathing muscles. So, so now I'm in fight or flight mode constantly all the time. So now my body's dumping, hey, he must need some adrenaline. <laughs> he, let's give him some perpetual adrenaline because he's perpetually breathing like there's an emergency. So I don't know what this emergency is, but we need to find a way to sustain it low key. So we're just going to drip. <laughs> we're just going to constantly drip adrenaline and cortisol for, for this chronic emergency that's going on. But that causes other problems. Now we get inflammation in our body and, and our hormones get really out of whack because, you know, when you got cortisol levels all up all the time, well, maybe now your testosterone and your estrogen get screwed up. So now your testosterone and your estrogen get screwed up. But you know what really is gets to be a problem is that you're not breathing the way you're designed to breathe anymore, filling your lungs up from the bottom to the top. So now your diaphragm is not stimulating your organs to move. So now your organs go silent because they're not moving and they're not generating the information for the brain and the brain doesn't know where your organs are anymore, perhaps, but they're themselves not getting stimulated to actually do their job because movement helps you digest. Movement helps your liver do what it does better. Movement helps your kidneys do what they do better. So all your vital organs are now getting like the shaft, so to speak, because you don't want to move. You just want to be comfortable in your chair. So now we've got poor breathing. We've got a change of physical structure. We've got hormones going crazy everywhere. Now we've got organs that aren't being able to perform their duties the way they're supposed to. And we got inflammation and all these things now actually create more inflammation, more inflammation, more inflammation. And then maybe you get something called something like metabolic syndrome, or maybe you get arthritis because you know what? You don't need joints if you're not going to use them. So 
if I'm not going to move my joints, I clearly don't need them. So I'm going to lay down bone in between my joints to create arthritis so I don't move my joints because eventually my design is to fuse those joints that I'm no longer using because they're just costing me energy. <laughs> so, so it gets to be this cascade of stuff. Yeah. And then we wonder, why don't I feel good? When I get up and walk to the mailbox or why don't I have energy? When I want to go outside for a walk, you know, when the, uh, the dog wants to walk and, oh my gosh, he's driving me crazy. Why don't I have the energy to go walk my dog? Or why can't I get down on the floor and play with my kids anymore? Why don't I, I don't, man, I don't, even, I don't the floor looks so far away and I'm, I don't even know if I can get back up. Right? So we create these things through disuse and, and, and really that is the design. Our design is such that it will give you what you ask for, which is amazing. That is the wonder. If you want something, ask it from your body and it'll give it to you. And you ask it by showing up every day and doing what you want it to do. And the converse of that is true. If you're not asking it for anything, you're asking it for nothing. So if you show up every day and sit, you're basically asking it to sit and also asking it not to do all that other stuff that requires all this energy, all this strength, all this ability. So, and that's a beautiful, wonderful design. We just don't understand it as much as we should. I heard something recently that I thought was really obvious, but profound that, that you, you're never not training movement. You're either, or, or you're never not training. You're either training like efficient, you know, right ways to move or you're training dysfunction. And I think that's a, like a, a really cool thing to think about because you just can't avoid it. It's not like you can or you can you can choose oh i'm not really somebody who likes to exercise or move you're training something regardless yeah. and and the cool thing is is like so the health and fitness industry has created this idea of what exercise is and like whatever that yeah so most people when they think exercise a picture pops in their head uh, a story a uh, fear a uh, disdain whatever but we're not made to exercise and that's the good news so you don't have to <laughs> If you want to and you enjoy it, have at it because it can feel amazing. It, it can feel great, especially it can be a drug. It, you can be addicting. I've been yeah. there. I'm, I'm still there. I love it. But I love to move. And I use movement as my exercise a lot of the times too, right? So, But we're made to move. So if you don't like exercise, don't worry about it. But you do want to like moving because that is actually your design. And it will improve the quality of your life by leaps and bounds. That's a good one. We're not made to exercise, but we are made to move. There yeah. are little shifts that are, I mean, that's a, uh, a game changer for somebody to think about. Yeah. So you're, you're not made to be born, uh, you know, walk around with a dumbbell in your hand. You don't need to ever pick up iron or swing a bell or do any of that stuff. You can, if you want to, but walking, let's talk about that. You're made to walk. And that could be one of the best things that keeps your brain healthy and your torso amazingly strong and resilient. And see, that sounds crazy, right? How's walking going to keep you strong and resilient? Because it will if you do it right. Um, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's our miracle movement. It keeps us healthy and gives us longevity. And it actually keeps muscle and, 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 and structural integrity if you do it right. Um, but a lot of people get from one place to the other on their feet without actually walking the way they're designed to walk. So it's, you know, it's, it's again, some things look like some things, but they're not actually some things <laughs> yeah. walking from walking from a to B with your feet, but not using your arms is getting there, but it's not true walking. So walking takes four limbs to move in a coordinated rhythmic fashion. And that, that movement of those four limbs is what keeps the brain so healthy. And so resilient. And I mean, it, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing to try to understand, but we are just a culture that's so sold on quick fixes and, and, you know, not having to participate in our own like healing and, you know, however you want to word it, but walking is, has as much science. I, I mean, I think if you really go into what the science shows it has more science than any kind of drug that somebody could take for depression or anxiety um and you know it's so underutilized and and it is and it can be used as a way to heal your emotions heal your thoughts um it there's there's just something amazingly soothing 
um, and about going for a brisk walk. If you're struggling with a, a issue, if if you're trying to solve something, if you're angry, like a brisk walk can can fix what's wrong with you a lot of times. When I was, uh, this is back in 2011, roughly, but I was coming out of rehab and, you know, struggling to find my way. And I got a dog kind of not necessarily my choice, but I wound up with a dog who wound up being, you know, the best, one of the best things that's ever happened to me. But what happened was for some reason, I was a mess in my life, but I committed that I was going to take care of this dog. And, and I knew that that meant walking it. And I, I, swear on the fact that I think a huge part of just never looking back and being able to turn my life around was walking twice a day. And I no longer have a dog, but I still walk at least daily, you know, but, but, you know, if at all possible twice a day, but walking is just like, it's a way of life really. I mean, to me, building everything else on top of that is, you know, can, can really be life-changing. Absolutely. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Did you love that dog? Oh Yeah. So, and that, I think that was also the magic for you. Um, we're made to move. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're also made to be social and we're made for love, right? Yeah. Can't get, can't get around it. Um, and there's, it's crazy. Like I've, I've seen a statistics that dog owners live 10 years longer than people that don't mm. own dogs. Now, why would that be? Yes, they're walking them, but also the love and that bond sure. that they have with their pet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now dogs are... Dogs are great medicine as well. Um, I wanted to go back to when you were explaining the sitting aspect of things, because I think there's some some really simple things that people can take away about how that can, you know, some of what you said can impact mental health, emotional health. Um, you're talking about posture and about, you know, forming into a C. I think there's one instance and we see, you know, there's a there's a mental health crisis, let's say. And our tendency as a problem, problem solving, you know, modern world is just to like, try to solve a problem on its surface. And I think far too people are asking like, well, why, why now? Why in addition to addiction? Why are there, you know, rising levels of depression and anxiety and ADD? And, you know, I mean, there's, you can go down many roads with this, but if you just look at what it means to be a human being, and we focus specifically on the movement aspect since that's what we're talking about. Like your posture winds up like this. You're cutting off proper oxygen flow to your brain. There's one thing can affect concentration, can affect the ability to be calm and emotionally stable. Then you take what you were talking about with the diaphragm. And as soon as, you know, we're not properly breathing diaphragmatically and, and especially when we're chronically in fight or flight, like that is tell you know that is somebody from the body up to the brain telling the brain like something's wrong here like we need to be on edge we need and i think so many people don't know why you know generalized anxiety is a big thing and we kind of just say like oh it's a thing it's a symptom you know it's just something that's there or or like a cause and not a symptom i think is how we really treat it a lot of the times but you look at that and we are telling ourselves we might not be meaning to but we're telling ourselves like be on high alert be ready to panic you know don't settle down because something in our environment is you know potentially threatening but when when we lose that capacity to to breathe properly there's another component to not being able to concentrate to being anxious to you know contributing to depressive states you mentioned organ function when you know i mean various organs are connected to our brain. And I mean, they're all like interconnected, but even like thinking about, you know, there's some interesting people who I agree with in my opinion and experience that mental health is largely metabolic, like to, to, to just go up to the brain and start thinking like chemical imbalances and this and that, even if that's there, which, you know, can be arguable in some cases of like how much we want to run to that. It's still probably just a symptom of, you know, upstream issues let's say but if you think about the metabolic possibility or the you know that our mental health issues are stemming from metabolic issues you then involve well all organs and all of this just ties together to again it's it's kind of like that statement it's not your fault but it is your responsibility that once we know better we can do better 
And most people are just living completely disconnected from how a human is meant to live. And it's like not that surprising when you look up and say, well, yeah, like we're, we're all depressed and anxious for good reason, largely, because our bodies and brains are trying to tell ourselves like, you're not, you're not like living how you're meant to live. And, and like, here's a wake up call, but, but we don't really know how to read that properly. I, yes, a hundred percent. I I think we've gotten good at existing versus get being good at living, I think. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And yeah, it's, I don't know, man. It's a, it's an issue. I don't know how to fix yeah. it. I mean, well, I have an idea, but, yeah. <laughs> but if we just need to move more, I mean, we need to yeah. move. It's, I mean, I, I think <laughs> that, uh, well, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. And I think it's why movement, even as a principle and not just what it, what it may do is so important is because oftentimes when people do start to move, they start to want to be more intentional with what they eat and maybe trying to get more sleep. I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, working out, still having that, that component of movement can be really good for people when they're struggling to change their lifestyles, because it's something that kind of anchors in like, well, I have to sleep. If I want to recover, I have to eat well, if I want to build muscle and, you know, so it, it tends to tie a lot of these things together. However, would you, um, Actually, you know what I, I wanted to go into? I want to go through each movement. So the six, you know, main presets. And if you are open to that, kind of just in as much detail as you want on each one, kind of explaining like when somebody's doing each one of these things, which I'll I'll mention them one at a time, they can seem so simple. They can seem even silly, some of them, but like what's actually happening i mean in in my you know in the in the uh certification manual there's some very interesting tidbits on you know how how pathways are running or you know how how we're stimulating pathways into the brain and things like that but if we were to break down add anything you want correct me where i may be wrong but that original strength is largely using the diaphragm activating the vestibular system and moving in cross crawl and contralateral patterns um and that we do that through breathing head movement head control rolling rocking and crawling breathing head movement yep. is that five or six That's Did it. I say it's five yeah five yeah so um you know like there's a whole system there it's it's something that anybody can learn it's exciting because it is something that you know the the strongest strong man can benefit from and like the most, you know, bordering on cripple old lady can benefit from. Um, but if we break that down into each one, like if we start with breathing, we kind of touched on that. But if you want, if you want to just add anything that maybe you didn't uh, with what you were saying with sitting, like if we go through each one, where would you start with breathing? Yeah. So like you said, there are five resets and these are the, they are so simple um, and they're so simple. They'll be dismissed by so many people but if you major in these five if you get if you spend any time in these five things um it'll improve everything about how you move how you feel and how you think no matter who you are everybody Mm. period because this is your design and you can't get away from it so the first reset is breathing we are born to breathe in and out through our nose with our tongue on the roof of our mouth that's it (laughs) and if we just do that it will make our lives so much better, so much better. So in and out through the nose, tongue on the roof of the mouth, letting the diaphragm fill the lungs up from the bottom to the top. You can call that belly breathing, but it's really, it's just really just breathing, filling the lungs up from the bottom to the top. It's not just the belly that expands, it's the whole center, front, back, sides, everything expands. What it is not is just breathing up in your neck and your chest through your mouth mouth breathing and emergency breathing causes more problems than probably almost anything um, because it leads to all these other issues. So breathing, that that's the first reset. Um, head control, that's the second reset. Um, our design, it, it, this is where you have fallen in love with the human body is that like we're, we're born helpless compared to other animals. Um, 
we're born with a giant watermelon for a head on, on a little body that's not even hardly strong enough to lift it. And so that head, you can look at that as like your weight room that you take wherever you go. And through the riding reflex, which demands that the baby gets his eyes and head on the horizon, through that reflex, that baby gets ridiculously strong at controlling the movements of that big giant watermelon. Mm. Um, so what that translates to us as no matter what age you are, you should still have control of your watermelon, even if it's only the size of a peanut when you're an adult. But that means is you need to move your eyes and your head often because in your head is where your vestibular system lives. And it is the information crossroads system that everything passes through before it goes into the brain. It's not just your balance system, but movement is what keeps it healthy. Um, if we were to go out in space, there would be no stimulus on our vestibular system and our body would immediately start getting rid of bone and muscle tissue immediately because mm -hmm. now there's no pull, there's no need, there's no gravity. Your vestibular system is built and designed for stimulation and movement in respect to gravity. And that's what keeps your body tied together. It's amazing. The reset after that. Can we go, is, can we go back yeah. for one second? Yeah. So I, I wanted to ask you too about the tongue on the roof of the mouth. I know it's a, it's a, you know, it, it's a thread through all of the resets, but can you explain why that is important? Ah, uh, so it makes everything better. Uh, my simplest layman's explanation is, so imagine your tongue's like a light switch. When the tongue, when the light switch is down, the tongue is down. All the lights are off. Don't have a lot of information. You just know it's dark and you can't really see everything. Um, and you're going to be a little bit cautious if you were trying to run, you know, through a room that where there were no lights. But if the light switches up, the tongue is up where it belongs. All the lights are on. You can clearly mm. see where everything's at. And your brain has all the information it's looking for to feel safe and secure enough to allow you to fully and freely express yourself. Um, it's, it's the coolest, most amazing thing. And it's, uh, it, if the tongue is where it belongs, it's easier to breathe. It's easier to fill your lungs up from the bottom to the top. And it's also just easier to move. You can move quicker, stronger, more range of motion, more stability. All of the quality expressions of movement that dance together, the tongue enhances it. Um, so it's just, that is the master light switch for me. <laughs> And, and I know that this is true. I don't know that off the top of my head, I've probably like read about it, but the, the tongue plays a pretty big role in like spinal stability, right? And even, even plays a role in like our hips and pelvis and things like that. Plays a role in everything. There's not, yeah. again, so think about this. Um, there's not one part of you that you can isolate and put into a vacuum, right? Which means every part of you affects every other part of you, bar none. Some have a little bit or a lot more influence seemingly so than others, but mm. everything affects everything. The yeah. tongue's influence on the whole body is pretty, pretty huge. So then with the, the breathing to, to go back to that one, what, you know, I mean, that's obviously when I started doing, regardless of, you know, I've done like oxygen advantage training and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the book breath by James, Nestor, um, but you know, like very profoundly interested in in breathing and like seeing a lot of benefits. But I was still tempted when I first started, you know, doing original strength to like kind of keep the breathing, uh, or you know, to to short change the breathing, not to spend as much time, maybe not to to put as much effort into that. Um, which obviously, I know you wouldn't recommend. Like I wouldn't recommend it at this point after you know, a, a lot more experience with it and understanding why, but how, how would you explain to somebody that just like, if you're taking one of the basic breathing positions, maybe somebody's starting. Um, and I think just as a, like an easy takeaway that I really like to use is that when you're initially trying to reconnect to your diaphragm and breathe properly, the closer your rib cage is to your pelvis, the easier that would be. Is that a, an accurate statement? Uh, accurate for like most pulling people. your pulling your knee. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something similar to that is in one of our, yes. or is in one of the, so it's like the, manuals. it's like the 80, 20 rule, right? Like, so that would be accurate for about 80% of people, but there'll be 20% that need a different, a different okay. position. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so if somebody's, you know, starting in one of these positions, maybe laying on their back with their knees pulled in and reconnecting with diaphragmatic breathing, 
what's what's just like happening there what's what's happening physiologically when somebody's taking that time to breathe well uh, on uh, and again um, from a simple explanation um when the diaphragm is doing its job properly it's it's filling the lungs up from bottom to top. It's moving the organs. It's dancing with the pelvic floor. It's uh, helping to stabilize the spine. It's generating all this wonderful information and giving more information to the brain so that the brain, again, it's like turning all the lights on. It's so the brain can mm. clearly see where everything's at. And that's important because your brain's always asking one question. Am I safe? Because your brain's number one job is to protect you mm. so that you get through the moment and through the next day. So every second, your brain's filtering billions of bits of information, wondering with just one question, am I safe? And if the brain feels safe, it will let you move freely and express yourself well. It'll let you feel good. If the brain doesn't feel safe, if it thinks something's wrong, it's going to put some restrictions on you and it's going to limit how you move, how you feel and how you think. Um, it's a survival mechanism, right? So, so when you're laying there and you return to your original sign of breath, you are sending a clear message. Yes, I am safe. Yeah. Thank you. That, that, that's a great way of thinking about it. Um, for the head movements, we were about to go to rolling, but I just wanted to say, can you mm -hmm. say a little bit about how using your eyes in that way, if you would, I, I believe that I read this part from, um, you know, from you, but I know it's more widely out there. Are you familiar with like EMDR for uh, trauma, which uses eye movements, but just how even using your eyes in that way. And like, it's been so much my experience when I feel like my mind is racing, head movements tend to be, I, I mean, eye and head movements tend to be one of the ones that I write as I'm doing that. And after I'm like, that really had a calming effect, but how moving our eyes and these simple ways, again, like maybe even just laying with your head on the floor, looking side to side and up and down, leading with your eyes, like how that impacts the brain and how that can actually have a calming effect on the brain and body. Yeah. So the body's designed to follow the head, but the head's designed to follow the eyes. Uh, the most important thing is, is like, if you listen to follow the eyes, the eyes are clearly designed to move. Um, and most people in today's world, we're very good at fixing our eyes and, and only occupying a certain field of vision, right? We've got phones, computers, books, windshields, whatever, but we're good at looking here. Um, and we might wear glasses. So we may be good at only looking inside these small little circles, these like a literal frame of reference. Um, but if we are not moving our eyes everywhere, well, again, it's like silence, like if you're not moving to your full range of motion as often as you're designed to, well, then you're just, you're generating no information. You're generating silence and silence can be interpreted as a threat because hmm. I don't have the, I don't have the best picture of where everything's at. So to move our eyes and their full range of motion, like if you just sit here right now and you move your eyes all the way to the left and all the way to the right, most people that try that will feel their neck wanting begging them to move it as well hmm. every muscle in your body is pretty much attached to the movement of your eyes <laughs> and your especially the movement of your head right but the eyes initiate the movement of the head which tells the entire body how you want it to move um and there's just such a strong reflexive connection there between your head your eyes your head and your center um and so taking advantage of that full range of motion, not only does it connect you physically, it gives the brain all this wonderful information that it's looking for. And it, that question that the brain's always asking, am I safe? Mm. Now, again, once again, as long as there's no visual threat coming into the eyes, right? Because they're processed, like the brain's going to process all that information. But because the eyes are now moving, going through their full range of motion, then the brain knows for whatever, the, it might be that the brain just knows that the eyes are okay. They're not damaged. They can still move everywhere and take in even more information. And the more information you can take in, well, the safer you're going to end up being because you don't have tunnel vision and you're not just fixed right here. Mm. So now you're safer because your eyes can oh, freely yeah, move everywhere, right? So, so then again, well, now if I'm safe, oh gosh, it feels so good to be safe. It just feels good. And then it just feels good, right? So then you get into, I'm safe. I feel, I feel good. I just, and, and, and then you run with that, you know, like it feels good to feel good. 
all, awesome. all from something simple, like you know, yeah. moving your eyes around or, or breathing the way you're supposed to breathe, keeping your tongue on the roof of your mouth. Yeah. So you were going to go into rolling. Oh yeah. Okay. So rolling further stimulates your vestibular system, but it also, to me, rolling turns on every switch in the house um, because your skin is your largest tactile organ. And when you roll, you're flooding your brain with all the information about your body, where it is and what it's doing. All your muscles, so is it, all, all your is joints. Is it accurate 640,000 sensory points feeding through something like 500 neural pathways? I would say that's accurate, but... I definitely got can, it from my training, so... how? Can, yeah, but that's the thing is... is how can you really... It's at least that much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, I, 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 here's the thing. The wonder of the body, I bet it's even still more complicated and more in depth than just that, yeah. right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so it's at least that much, right? But okay, but just say, say, say there's only 20. Say there's only 20 nerve endings or sensory reports on your body. But if you don't roll, you're never going to touch them all. Hmm. You're never going to stimulate them all. But there's way more than 20, right? So... So all this sensation now floods up and in, in, goes in through with the vestibular system into the brain that for the biggest, clearest, best picture that the brain can have. The other wonderful thing it does for you, you know, some is series always listen. The other wonderful thing it does for you is that it rotates the vertebrae hmm. and it keeps your, your spine extremely healthy and the healthier your spine is, which contains your spinal cord the safer your brain's going to feel hmm. and the better you're going to feel because when a, a healthy moving spine keeps muscles, keeps the stabilizers are doing their job, the movers are doing their job and nobody has to compensate and put you in bed for two weeks because you picked up a pencil wrong. So, so rolling just literally turns all the lights on and keeps the spine healthy, able, uh, stimulates the vestibular system even more. Um, and ties your shoulders to your hips, um, which is your torso, just connects your torso so that you can be graceful through life. Would you say, uh, I don't want to forget to ask this, but I just thought of it that um, even original strength as a way, if somebody were to tweak something in the gym or or have that, you know, like what you were just explaining, like that's a great way, original strength to kind of get the body to move past that right i mean maybe not instantly but it but going uh, through these movements would be absolutely you know, yeah and then sometimes it is instant because change yeah, happens yeah. at the speed of your nervous system sometimes and now if it's a true physical injury with tissue structure and damage well then it will still help your nervous system but now we've got to have healing for the tissue damage that was created right mm -hmm. But to take that a step further original strength inside your physical therapist's office or inside your chiropractor's office well, now it's even stronger because now you can use all the healing modalities together to give the body its best chance to to heal itself quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So how about uh rocking? Rocking is uh also to me it's like a miracle movement. Uh, it teaches all your joints how to play together. It takes all the members of all the instruments that you would look at and think are separate instruments and puts them all together to make a symphony of just beautiful music. It teaches your hips, your shoulders, your knees, your ankles, your toes, your elbows, your wrists, your spine. It teaches your everything. It teaches everything how to play together and move together as one whole body. Uh, and, but it's also rocking, right? So it's back and forth. It's extremely emotionally soothing. Um, it's can, a you, great, can you can you say more about that? Yeah, emotionally so soothing. Rocking is a great way to help regulate your your brain and your emotions. Um, Everybody know intuitively. Everyone knows this. If you've got a crying child, you try to rock it. You, you maybe you hum to it and you rock it. Um, if a if a child uh, doesn't isn't around the caregiver and it really really loses its uh, emotions, it might start rocking to self soothe itself. Adults do the same thing. We often call it swaying. Um, I've heard a lot of adults spontaneously start humming uh, to self soothe themselves too, but. Rocking that swaying motion back and forth, it just, it's like being on a, on a raft out in the, the middle of a lake or a pool, that just that undulation, mm. it just really calms the nervous system and helps take away all the emergencies, all the alarms, all the threats, and it soothes us. And that's why rocking is so powerful for children, 
And that's why rocking is so powerful for adults. Uh, it, it, we're all just big kids anyway, right? We, we never even lose that, 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 those original programs that were, you know, that are our foundation anyway. So, so it never stops working. Um, but a power, like if you're listening and you just really want to make yourself feel good, get on your hands and knees, keep your eyes and head on the horizon, rock back and forth and hum. <laughs> and you will probably feel very good in about two to three minutes. Would, would, uh, well, let's go to crawling and then I'll ask you that yeah. the question I was just going to. So crawling is definitely the miracle movement. Um, it ties both hemispheres of your brain together, uh, makes your brain very efficient. It ties your, your, your body completely together, knits it together. It teaches your joints how to mirror each other, your opposing joints. So like your left arm will mirror your right leg uh, or your left shoulder will mirror your right hip. Um, so it it is what knits us together. It connects our X. Like if your body's a big X, crawling is what makes that X very resilient and strong um, from the inside out. Uh, now, as adults, we are designed to get up on two feet and walk. And that's where crawling passes the baton to the ultimate miracle movement of walking. But again, it takes four limbs to crawl from A to B. Kind of hard to do it without those four dancing together. And so that is the, the pattern when we stand up on two feet. Those four limbs are still dancing together to get you from A to B. And is there, um, is there anything, I mean, I know walking is kind of the, like obviously the end point for development. And it, it's, it's cool that when I was, when I found original strength and when I was starting to kind of get into it and go through it, we had a newborn baby. So I was able to watch as he went through all of this stuff and, and, uh, That's you know, awesome. it made it all that much cooler. Um, but for walking, is there anything else besides, and let me ask you, do you have a hard stop at 11? Okay. Well, we'll keep it within a couple minutes, but I just have one more question and a couple quick fire, if that's good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So for walking, you mentioned already that we need to be using all four limbs. So the, you know, essentially the cross crawl pattern, is there anything else? Because you had talked about how a lot of people will move from point A to point B, but they're not necessarily walking. Is there any other uh, like cues that people might think about that can help them to be better walkers? Oh, um, it's weird. I, I don't know. I almost say learn how to learn how to be intentional with it. Um, I, for some people, if they just can't quite find the pattern, I'll just tell them because a lot of times when you start thinking about something, your brain gets in the way of movement um, and it sabotages your movement patterns because like we all have these patterns in us. They're hardwired. Yeah. In us. We just got to uncover them again. Right. Um, so sometimes thought gets in the way. So a lot of times I'll say to somebody, hey, don't think, just get from here to there as briskly as you can with a walk. And when they start walking briskly as if they're late for something, magically, a lot of times their shoulders start swinging to match their hips. Um, the other tip for walking, I would say would be, hey, let's practice. Let's let's really make your body amazingly resilient. And let's practice walking at a at a brisk pace with your lips shut. Because now we're going to combine nasal breathing and get your diaphragm doing its job better with your tongue on the roof of your mouth. That's going to make walking stronger, better, and more efficient. And what, is there anything that you would comment on the feet? I know you're big on barefoot shoes too and, you know, strong feet, but is there anything, like, is that something that you see kind of just tying in naturally? And I understand too that leading up to walking, doing all of these resets is obviously going to help make, you know, one a better walker too. Right. Um, feet. So <laughs> this is funny. I was going to say people are pretty touchy about feet, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I would say like I, and because I'm a fan of something doesn't mean that that's where somebody needs to start. So I'm also comfort level because your thoughts are information too, right? So if you're afraid to be in minimalist mm -hmm. shoes or you're afraid to be barefoot, now we've got negative information going into the system and it's actually going to affect, affect the expression, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say whatever you're comfortable in to start with, do that, but then get curious and start exploring other, other textures, other surfaces, other uh, widths of or heights of shoe. Um, we were born barefoot, and the design. There's no mistakes in the design, and that's that's. I think that's where we mess up. We always want to improve the design, but guess what, guys? It's perfect. It is perfect. 
um, that the foot is such an amazing structure in itself and a healthy foot will produce a health, it will, a healthy body comes with a healthy foot. That's it. Mm -hmm. But if your foot is not healthy, then you have compromised your entire structure, right? So, so if we learn how to walk barefoot or in minimalist footwear, we're allowing our foot the opportunity to move all through, to articulate through all of its joints. There's 33 joints in your foot each foot, right? So, and if those joints are moving and doing their job and then all those little muscles are stabilizing and moving those joints as they're supposed to, that's going to give your ankle its best chance at moving the way it's supposed to, which gives your knee its best chance at moving the way it's supposed to, which gives your hip its best chance, which gives your spine, your SI joint its best chance, your neck, your shoulders, and it all comes from the foot. And so if the foot is, 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 has all of its structural integrity in place, more than likely your body is going to be very healthy. So you would say maybe that, uh, I, I understand what you mean about having, you know, maybe a fear around barefoot or, or being scared to do that. But it, would you say that you'd agree with it being worth at least people considering that oftentimes issues further up the body could be coming from, you know, feet that have become dormant from, athletic shoes that have too much cushioning and support and all this kind of stuff. All right. So this is crazy. Your jaw pain, your team J could come because your big toe is not moving. Right. Mm. Your shoulder could hurt <laughs> because something in your foot's a little stiff or sticky. Um, but to reverse that your knee could hurt or your ankle could hurt because something in the top of your neck is not moving. Right. Mm. So we are from the bottom up and the top down connected. Yeah. I can't get away from it. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I have a couple of quick fire questions for you. Uh, before we do that, can you tell our listeners where they can find you online? Anything that you'd like to direct people to? Yeah. Um, if you would like to learn more about original strength or if you're a physician or um, a therapist and you want to learn more for your practice, you can go to originalstrength.net. If you're a layman, you can also go to originalstrength.net. Uh, but hey, if you just want to feel better and feel good and amazing in your own body, you can definitely go to originalstrength.net. But I also have a YouTube channel that has, I don't know, I'm guessing maybe 500 videos of quick, quick little videos of, of the things that Keith and I have been talking about um, that if you'll just engage in them you'll probably love the way you start to feel uh, yeah that's the all youtube free. is yeah the youtube there's a ton of great resources you can really <laughs> find pretty much anything you need to start all right so for questions um i know that you're a christian what is your favorite passage in the bible or one that one you know i'm sure you have many but one that you find strength in and uh, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall rise up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary and they shall walk and not faint. I, that one, that one has given me a lot of comfort through the years and a lot of hope. I think, I think you have that in the intro. It might be too reloaded. It might be in the original, original strength book, but I'm pretty sure you have it in the intro of one. And I will just say that for anybody who you know, maybe once a little more or to be inspired on a deeper level, like the, the intros that you write to your books are so good. They hit you on like your gut, your heart, your mind, your spirit. But in terms of how movement and strength is, you know, part of our design and why we should be, or, you know, why we can be reverent toward that, like the intros of your books will absolutely uh, get somebody to want to buy into this, in my opinion. Wow. So thank you, to anybody out there. Yeah, no, I mean, I really... I, I have given your book to different people and just be like, just read the info or the intro. If you get into the rest, like I'll leave that to you, but read the intro and I trust that it'll lead them into more. And it, it, it does. Um, what excites you most these days? Oh, honestly. So, and sometimes I have to be reminded, but like, so, uh, over the last weekend, we just did four workshops, two certifications and two new workshops nothing lights my wick like seeing someone discover how amazing their body is or discover that they're not stuck and not broken. Hmm. Like when you see that like flicker 
or it's not even, it's like an explosion of hope in their eyes and their eyes get really big and they're like, and then you see their eyes moving because they're trying to process what just happened in their body. And you know, they, that what they're figuring out is, is I'm not stuck this way. This can change. And mm -hmm. in fact, it just did. And that's the weirdest thing in the world. I don't understand it. That, that lights my fire like nothing else. And it's just so cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I hope to make it down one day before too long for a, uh, you know, for the next level certification. So we'll put that out there. Um, what is a piece of advice that you received that has meant a lot to you and you think could be valuable to other people? Oh, I'm sure there's a ton. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one that I just got last week and it was timely. It might be timely for anyone listening. <laughs> um, remember that you're always loved. Mm. And then I, there's just something about that that just makes things better than certainly better than they otherwise would be <laughs> if you forgot yeah. that you were loved. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, two to three books that you think would be helpful for this is, you know, my podcast is mainly designed mental holistic mental health for men, but maybe two to three books that you think, um, you know, given that, the body the soul everything is obviously playing into that um but yeah what are two or three books that you think could be helpful to a man to read oh my gosh um you can edit out the blank spaces i think through all the books oh, that's all right no think <laughs> so, no that's that's oh my of... gosh um you know for a guy i think anything by john eldridge uh would yeah, be i know would be strong I mean, he, he, he's strong as thunder sometimes, um, all the time. Uh, so any book by John Eldridge is probably fantastic. Uh, gosh. I think honestly too, like if you're up for it, um, the book of John in the Bible can be very hopeful and uplifting. Um, or for a guy, like if you ever read, just reading through Psalms to look at the struggles of, of David, um, in his life, like his ups, his downs, his in-betweens, like it's all there. Um, like yeah. it's, so it's, it's, it's the condition of being a human is, is right there, like thriving, um, surviving back to thriving, uh, like, and that's inspiring for me because I mean, man, when you go through stuff your thoughts can taint, right? And they, they can consume you, but you're not alone. Other people have gone through, they go through stuff too. And, and David just lays it all out there for you to read. Some of it's horrible. And then some of it's amazingly fantastic, but you can see the peaks and the valleys. I think it just helps you appreciate where you are and that you're not, you are not stuck in and you'll get to the other side of this eventually. That's a great, great piece to end on. I appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time. Um, again, for anybody has, you know, further action to take, check out Tim's YouTube channel, Original Strength, OriginalStrength.net. And Tim, if you can hang on for just a minute while I close out the show. Yes, sir. Hey, thanks for having me, Keith. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And head over to risingstronger.com. You can join my growing email list by entering your email address or downloading my free guide, the High Mileage Foods for Better Mental Health Guide. I do offer a free 30-minute coaching consultation. You can sign up for that there as well. And again, I appreciate your time. I'll see you in the next episode.